Father Cardo is the Pope Benedict the 16th chair of liturgical studies at St. John Vianney Theological Seminary in Denver, Colorado. He's the author of several books, uh, most notably The Art of Preaching, A Theological and Practical Primer, which was published earlier this year. Uh, welcome, Father Cardo. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it really is for me, and, and I mean this, uh, a source of great joy to be in an event like this. I understand many of you are, are watching and probably will watch later. Uh, and I understand as well that many of you who are watching, probably most of you are actually preachers, um, which is really encouraging because I think for a preacher to take that time to whether read something on preaching or, or watch a talk, a presentation on preaching, uh, that means that there is not only some sort of academic interest. I mean, we can you know, read many things, uh, but when we read something that will say something about what we do, uh, I'm convinced that that demands a certain, at least some, and probably a lot of openness to continue to learn and, and to hopefully do it even better because preaching in the end is, is an office, a work of love, and therefore we can always uh, lean, learn more how to do it well as the Lord expects. So it is a source of great hope really to be with you and to share just some thoughts about preaching. Uh, if I may, it's in a, in a selfish way, uh, it is also a source of hope because as it was mentioned, I just published uh, this little book here, uh, The Art of Preaching uh, with CUA. And it was interesting because when I was sharing about this book with uh, some parishioners, uh, some of them said, look, I would love to actually share and give this book to this priest friend, et cetera. And then they, they paused. Okay, do I really wanna give a book on preaching to my former pastor? Someone said that it might be like giving a, a young lady a, a book on how to lose weight or something like that. Uh, but seeing that you are here, uh, I think that there is, there is a lot of hope, actually, because we who preach uh, know that this is a call from God and a vocation of love, and therefore we want to, to learn more. And we know that it is extremely important. Um, it is very important because, to begin with, um, we know very well that we live in very complicated times. I and mean, that's a state, the, the understatement of, of this evening, but we re live in increasingly difficult times. Uh, the, the global crisis that we are witnessing uh, with the extra uh, elements of, of expansion in the way in which we perceive them through social media and all of that, which lead in many cases to a growing distrust in tradition and institutions and to a very strong sense of confusion and particularly polarization in the world and in the church on top of that, the scandals um, that we've all sadly witnessed within the church and the very aggressive secularism that continues to penetrate institutions and minds, and perhaps even though we might not notice even our own minds, all of that creates just a very complicated situation. And, and we can probably all, all uh, give testimony to this, even in the past 18 months, things feel heavier, more complicated, more critical. We witness, I think it's honest and fair to say, the failure of many of our ecclesial methods and, and systems that in many ways worked some decades ago and now just don't work. It is what Fulton Sheen described as the end of Christendom, not of Christianity, not of the church, but of Christendom. This uh, cultural respect of the church that is manifested in so many institutions and buildings and projects. We don't have that anymore. So the status quo is collapsing. And when we just reflect on some of the data that we have, that around 10% only of millennials who have been raised in the faith actually continue to practice their faith, then the likely, humanly speaking, bleakness of the next decades actually fill us with real and understandable uncertainty. So what are we supposed to do in this situation? Because again, if we just look at the facts, if something doesn't change, then we have a lot of reasons to be concerned. But the truth is that there is no program that can fix the problem. These are times to go to the roots of who we are, of our faith, meaning to go to Christ. And this is my first point that 
will lead us into uh, preaching. Most Catholics don't necessarily know how to quote unquote, do this, how to go to Christ. The majority of baptized Catholics do not necessarily experience their faith as communion with a divine person, as friendship, as discipleship. Most Catholics have learned many things about God, in catechesis, religious education, Catholic school, etc. cetera, uh, but few have learned how to know him. Now, we all also can give testimony to, of course, a lot of great things happening in the church. There are wonderful ministries, there are new projects, movements that are bearing real fruit, and all of that is wonderful. But still, if we are very realistic, most Catholics, let's say most Catholics who practice their faith, will not likely attend most of these extra uh, Sunday uh, events or talks or Bible studies. Um, few will read books, uh, few will use some of the amazing new technological resources that we have to share our faith. This is a simple fact, but most uh, practicing Catholics will do one thing and one thing only. We'll attend one event and only one, and that is Sunday Mass. And this is a crucial thing. Because as we know very well, the renewal of the liturgy is at the core of the renewal of the church. And the Eucharist is at the center. This is a source and the summit. The renewal of the liturgy at each parish is at the core of the renewal of each parish. And there is nothing more important theologically, but even practically. Because most Catholics will experience their faith at Mass. And for better or for worse, Few things are expected uh, more at a, any given Sunday Mass than the homily. Now, to be sure, as a footnote, uh, it is clear that many times this reflects a limited understanding of the mysteries of the Mass. That is very clear. However, this means that most Catholics will, every Sunday, listen with at least some openness and benevolence to a homily. What do they experience? What happens in the church week after week, day after day, really, when people come and listen to uh, preachers? Let's think very practically here for a second. On a typical Sunday, there will be around, around this is approximately, uh, 15 million Catholics going to Mass in the US. So there will be around 70,000 homilies preached in this country. This is an average. But think about those numbers, 70,000 homilies every Sunday. It is hard to imagine any other institution at all having this kind of opportunity. So many speeches, not even recorded, live in front of people, basically about the same topic. Humanly speaking, the opportunity is just optimal. So what happens in those thousands and thousands of homilies? What happens in the hearts and in the minds of Catholics? That's a big question and not one that we can easily answer now. But at least I think for us who preach, that leads us into a personal question. What comes out of our hearts through our preaching. And no matter what the answer is, I think a conclusion is that we should try to preach as the Lord expects. We should try to preach as the apostles did. Think about what we read in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter preaching after Pentecost. Some 3,000 people converted. Even for the most rationalistic examination of this passage, we cannot deny there were many people who actually accepted Christ after that one preaching. What happens in our homilies? What happens Sunday after Sunday? And we should expect, we have the duty, our people have the right, to expect the preaching of bishops, priests, and deacons to be courageous, faithful, spiritual, engaging, moving, deep, serious. What might a couple of excellent, Christ-centered preaching cause in the church and in the world. 
Holiness is fostered by a good word said at the right time in the right way. A moving word matured in daily prayer and study, in the joys and sorrows of pastoral life, in patient meditation, purified and improved by countless conversations and visits to parishioners, illuminated by the many psalms recited every day, confronted by the pain shared with those who suffer, formed by the words of the liturgy. Holiness is encouraged by preachers who, though imperfect themselves, want to be saints, and who honestly, vulnerably, freely, and passionately share that desire in their homilies. The new spring that we so desperately need in the church does not start, it can be helped with, but does not start with mega plans, expensive studies, or big staffs. It starts with who we are as a church. And there, in the source and summit of our life and mission, with the liturgy and the Eucharist as a center, as a heart, in that river of grace, the words of good homilies can make all the difference. Catholics will know Jesus Christ more deeply and personally, will be disciples and apostles. So it is a revolution that is realistic and simple and possible. It is a springtime that we need and that begins with an unpretentious movement to love Christ and to know how to speak about him. And in my view, a central idea to try to grow in, in our preaching, whether we're doing it well or bad, I mean, that's not necessarily a question right now, but a key central idea is to understand our identity as preachers. And I would like to share a couple of thoughts here, particularly about the identity of priests as preachers, and obviously by extension, bishops, and as well, uh, deacons. But a key and central uh, truth here is that preaching is not just a task among many that we have. We have been ordained to preach. Preaching and its preparation is an ordinary path to become who we are called to be and therefore a path to harmony and joy and a path for a fruitful life. When Jesus called the 12, he called them, according to the Gospel of Mark, to be with him and then to send them forth to preach. And the order is relevant. The first mission of an apostle is to be with Christ, communion with Christ. This is crucial for preachers because a specific closeness to Christ required for the mission of a homilist is not only, although it is based on that, but it's not only the one shared by all believers in baptism, but one rooted in the sacramental life of the church in general and in the sacrament of holy orders in particular. And obviously, a homily can only be given by ordained ministers. So a man receives a sacrament of holy orders, not because of his own merits, obviously, but because of God's mercy. And when he's ordained, he's ordained to preach, we can expand this saying that he exists now in order to proclaim the good news. This was a turning point for the apostles. Jesus called them and they became sent. They were sent. They became apostles. That was their life. That was their mission. And we can hardly insist too much on this point. Preaching is not an accessory element in the life of a priest. Again, there are many things that we do, but this is an essential one. This mission arises from the particular sacramental character of our confirmation to Christ the head. Preaching is not just one of the many priestly missions we can receive. Some priests are going to be pastors, some are going to be parochial vicars, others chaplains, professors, but all priests, no exception, have been ordained to preach the gospel. And in some way, practically speaking, all priests will preach in one way or another. So preaching is not an extrinsic assignment, but an essential and permanent vocation imprinted by the indelible character of sacramental ordination. We could say that then when preaching becomes uh, uh, an ecclesial activity, 
Karin, uh, Father Joseph Ratzinger, when he wrote his book, Dogma and Preaching, said that the real crisis of preaching today is the crisis of ecclesial consciousness, is of ecclesial awareness that the church is a place in which we preach. But the two greatness of liturgical preaching in particular, not any kind of preaching, but liturgical preaching, resides in the paradox that a preacher loses in order to gain that a preacher is not a center of preaching, but because preaching takes place in the church, then we can say, as St. Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and we can expand. It is no longer I who speak, but Christ who lives in me through the mystery of his church. In me who having received the oil of gladness and imposition of hands can speak in his name lending my poor voice to the creative and redeeming world. The joy and the freedom of preachers is that, again quoting Paul, what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants. Therefore, in any homily pronounced, liturgical homily, with faith, faith and openness to the Holy Spirit, it becomes true what Augustine expressed in such a powerful, concise way when he said, Christ is preaching himself through the mystery of the church, through his ordained ministers. Christ is preaching himself. This means that we need to understand ourselves as preachers. To me, it can be an interesting uh, reflection to think about how ministers of other Christian confessions understand themselves. Bereft of the sacraments, their ministry is centered almost exclusively around the word and its proclamation. So they see themselves simply as the preacher. That's what they do. That's their main job. That's how they spend their time. Of course, our vocation as Catholic preachers is different and it's wider. But in regard to being ministers of the word, sealed by ordination to preach the gospel, we should see ourselves no less than any other minister as preachers. And in fact, the grave importance of preaching should be more keenly perceived by a Catholic preacher, or a priest, because of preaching's liturgical and sacramental roots. If we see ourselves as preachers, then hardly can we be satisfied with not fulfilling this duty joyfully and faithfully. In the end, the connection between our self-understanding and our exercise of our vocation to preach is absolutely essential. When a father with a family uh, sees as his priority his career or something else, rather than his family, his spouse, and his children, obviously there will be some neglect of that family because his self-understanding is not that of first and foremost a spouse and a father. He's thinking mostly about other things and not even necessarily bad things. When a priest, a bishop, and again by extension a deacon, when we see ourselves or when we care more about a number of other urgent things rather than as ministers of God's mysteries and including their uh, ministers of the word, then it is when we will justify that we don't have time to preach or to prepare because of who, uh, how we understand our own identity and therefore our own mission. But understanding ourselves as who we are, especially as who we've been marked to be because of ordination, then we can hardly see anything more important than this. Now, in this context, um, the next and really important and in many ways even difficult question is if it is actually possible to expect priests, deacons and bishops to preach well, to spend a significant amount of time meditating and reflecting on the word, to spend hours every week preparing a homily. And it is a <clears throat> valid question, especially for anyone who has some familiarity with our lives. Uh, it is true that we are busy. Quite honestly, I don't think we're necessarily busier than someone who has a normal job and works 40, 50, 
60 hours a week and then has to take care of kids at night. Uh, but still, we are busy. With the normal demands of a parish, with all the administrative tasks and things we have to do, with the unexpected demands of pastoral life, can it be honestly expected that pastors, bishops, deacons will have to find a time to preach well? So in other words, is the expectation of outstanding preaching a realistic one, one that we should cultivate? We can find some objections to this, and perhaps we can organize the objections just in two groups. One is a spiritual objection. The other one is a practical objection. The spiritual objection is basically if preparing a homily, is spending time praying, studying, reading, thinking, uh, and then coming to mass, say Sunday mass, to, with a homily already prepared, if that is not a way of limiting the action of the Holy Spirit in our preaching. About this, the Holy Father wrote not too long ago, trust in the Holy Spirit who is at work during the homily is not merely passive, but active and creative. It demands that we offer ourselves and all our abilities as instruments which God can use. A preacher who does not prepare is not spiritual. He is dishonest and irresponsible with the gifts he has received. If we can expand this, we can say that the persistent and faithful, gradual, effort to open our hearts and our minds to inspiration of the Holy Spirit can in an ordinary way, there are always exceptions, but in an ordinary way, be a more faithful and safe path to trust that the Holy Spirit will guide our discernment so that we can know what we're expected to say, what our people actually do need from us. The Spontaneous inspiration of every moment is not necessarily an inspiration that will always uh, produce good fruit. And even to be fair, and this is a teaching of some saints, even it will be uh, coming from that good spirit. Uh, that, that the evil spirit might want to distract from what we have faithfully prepared in several days of prayer, study, and reflection. So, Trust in the Holy Spirit does not necessarily mean being passive and just waiting for an inspiration in that moment. The other objection is just a practical objection, and it is busyness. The Holy Father said, some pastors argue that such preparation is not possible given the vast number of tasks which they must perform. Nonetheless, I presume to us that each week a sufficient portion of personal and community time be dedicated to this task. This is an important point. Even if less time has to be given to other important activities. It is true that there are a lot of things that we have to do, but it is also true that again, practically speaking, there will be no other moment in our week in which we will be in front of more people, of more parishioners, in which we can be just face to face, opening our hearts to them, teaching them, leading them to Christ. It makes little sense to invest our time. Again, this is just a very practical reflection, but it may, makes little sense to not have time to prepare well those homilies because we're busy doing a number of other things. Having time to prepare well actually is a path to unity in our busy lives. Because in preparing well a homily, we can find a unity between our prayer life and make sure that we do pray, our study and make sure that we do study and that theology is not just something that we had to do in seminary, but that is part of our daily, daily lives. And finally, in the preparation and delivery of the homily, prayer, study, join pastoral life, pastoral work. It really becomes a path to unity, to peace. Now, certainly, we need to be very reverent and recognize that many preachers are discouraged. Many people complain about homilies. That is one of the most common complaints. And it is very understandable that many preachers feel that negativity. 
and it is a very difficult situation. It is true that there are priests who are lonely and are overworked, that there is stress, that there is pressure, that there is a growing lack of credibility, that there are issues, there are real issues. But I argue that that does not mean that we need to wait until all those issues are solved in order to try to preach well, but rather that preaching can become the way to do just that, to grow. Let me read a couple of paragraphs about this. The life of many priests is filled with an unexpected number of tasks and demands. It is true that there will be some weeks in which we will not have the ideal amount of time for preparing our homilies. And by the way, I'm not going to offer any practical suggestions as how to do this. In the book, I do have one chapter on the preparation of the homily, another one on the delivery. Um, but it is true that there will be some of those weeks in which maybe we're sick, we were traveling, it's just really not possible. But this should be the exception. The rule is always to prioritize the time for our preparation, seeing in this activity the hinge between prayer, study, and pastoral work. In this way, the preparation of the homily can become a key for a healthy priestly life. Now, it is true, and we all have experienced this, all who preach, that there are times when a preacher experiences dryness and emptiness. There are moments when it is really hard to find what to say, in which we would so gratefully cling to a word said to us and not by us. Many preachers are discouraged. So again, can it be realistically expected of them to prepare homilies and to preach well? There's no simple answer to this. And for sure, all efforts should be made to promote the integral health and spiritual well-being of preachers. But this is an important point. The Lord has given us preaching as a path forward, a route to hope rather than another task and perhaps an oppressive one. It is through our pastoral charity in which preaching has such a central place that we can find meaning and light in those dark moments. In our pastoral experience, we all probably have accompanied people perhaps couples who were going through very difficult times. And surprisingly, at times, the love of their children is what made a difference. Similarly, it is a paternal love that marks our vocation that can save what at times might seem lost. It is in the act of dying to ourselves and given even if of our poverty, that we can allow God's grace to access mysterious paths to renew and refresh our lives. This truth is expressed in literary form in what might be, in my opinion, the most moving part of Bernard Noss's uh, famous novel, The Diary of a Country Priest. I don't know if you've read that. Sadly, I have to say the English translation is really, really bad. Uh, it really skips paragraphs, changes some parts, but this part is actually good. <laughs> this part they got right. Um, this, I don't know if you know the story, but this is a young priest, inexperienced, sickly, nothing is going well. He's in this parish, kind of lost in, in the countryside in France. Um, but in, during some very difficult times, he has a very powerful experience of helping someone, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. But his ministry does something very important, God through him. And later he reflects in his journal and writes this. O oh, miracle, thus to be able to give what we ourselves do not possess, sweet miracle of our empty hands, sweet miracle of our empty hands. When we feel our hands really empty and we still give, it is then that the Lord can do amazing things, not only through us, for other people, but also for us. Preaching really becomes the office, the work of love, as Augustine said. Let it be the service of love to feed the Lord's flock if it was a mark of fear to deny the shepherd. And additionally, we could ask ourselves if practically speaking, it would make sense to be so busy in a number of so many other things than in preparing our homilies. 
there is no other place where we can be more closely united to our people in a common journey of prayer and formation than in our homilies. And this is true for those who are just beginning, maybe even learning how to preach, and also for talented and experienced preachers. Preaching in the end is so important because it comes from love and leads to love. And because this is something that our hearers, our parishioners can tell. They're not expecting the most accomplished, polished, and refined public speakers. That's not what they expect. And if they expect that, they're wrong. But most, most people do not expect that. They expect a preacher who will be honest, sincere, vulnerable, and who, have prepared, who has prepared, who has spent time in prayer and reflection, who takes this mission seriously. There is a common idea which I think is wrong, and that is that our people can't really pay attention to our homilies, that we lose them in a minute or so, two or three max, that our attention span is so short that we cannot even pretend that they will listen to a, a homily, say, eight minutes. But what's happening in our world? Isn't it true that people, young and old, listen to podcasts, which many times are very long talks, isn't it true that people fill theaters to listen to some famous people giving speeches? Isn't it true that people pay money? Isn't it true that people would love to be able to get a ticket to a TED talk? So the idea that in general, people cannot pay attention to a speech, to the logic and beauty of a public speaking is simply not true. The question is, in all honesty, what do they experience when they come and listen to us? Augustine said, and let me close with this so that we can have some time for Q&A. St. Augustine said this, and I'm gonna close with a reflection on eloquence. There is a man who wishes to speak not only wisely, but eloquently, since he will surely be of more use if he can do both. In other words, being wise when we preach is certainly the most important thing. But if we can be wise and eloquent at the same time, we will be of greater service because through our eloquence, that wisdom of Christ through the church will actually have access to the minds and hearts of our listeners. And I think it's very important to realize that for us preachers, Eloquence is not a matter of aesthetics, but a matter of salvation. The place of preaching is a history of salvation. Preaching is not only a form of teaching, of exhorting, so that then someone on the pews will think about that and eventually put that into practice. It is that, but it's so much more than that. God worked his one history of salvation, we could say in three stages. He prefigured everything in the Old Testament. He fulfilled everything in Christ in the New Testament. And today, he continues everything through the church, mainly through the liturgy and the sacraments. Leo the Great said, that which, which was visible in a Redeemer comes to us through the sacraments. Jean Corbon wrote that after the resurrection, the economy, the dispensation of salvation, takes on the form of liturgy. The economy takes on the form of liberty. God, God saves today in a special way through the liturgical celebration. And because preaching, liturgical preaching is part of this mystery, then our preaching, our humble, imperfect preaching has that great background. We insert ourselves to humbly contribute in some way to the unfolding of the eternal plan of salvation. That's why it is very important to remember, again with Augustine, that an audience can be taught and delighted and still not give their full assent to the speaker. And what use will those two be if this third thing is lacking? So first, we teach. Second, we delight. But if that's the only, if those are the only two that we do, then what do we gain? We need 
to convince, not of anything we want to say, but of Christ's truth, of his message of love. We need to move the hearts so that people will actually follow Christ. Our mission, therefore, is to do just that. The what is essential, but the how can make all the difference. And that's why a continuous conversation about preaching, how do we preach, is so important. Because in the end, again, preaching is our vocation, and preaching is an act of love. I close with this, and uh, I give it back to Alex, and then maybe we can have some Q&A. So thank you very much. Uh, Father Cardo, thank you so very much uh, for that really wonderful talk. Uh, just to remind uh, those uh, who are participating in this webinar that the Q&A feature is down uh, in the bottom bar. Uh, feel free to submit your questions, uh, either with your name or anonymously. And as they come in, I can uh, moderate uh, at least a couple here. Uh, but as uh, people prepare those questions, I actually have one uh, myself for you, Father, if you don't mind. Uh, so I'm uh, in my second year here in formation at St. John's out of six. And given uh, your very beautiful words about the centrality of preaching in every priest's life, um, do you have any practical advice about how guys like me who are early on in the process can begin to develop those skills that will help them be effective preachers, uh, given that it's such an important part of our ministry uh, as future diocesan priests? Sure. Yeah, I mean, two things come to mind right away. Uh, one is that I think we should be very grateful that there is a significant growth of homiletic courses in seminaries, which was not a case years ago. You know, but now I think in at St. John's there are two semesters. I, I recently heard of homiletics, which is good. Uh, I think in general, homiletics preaching is being taught and practiced, and that is just really uh, something to look forward to and a sign of hope. Um, but obviously, you probably have not yet taken homiletics, and that, that probably comes later. I think a wonderful way uh, of, of preparing our hearts and our minds to preach is to be familiar. It's what we would call remote preparation. To be familiar with the best preachers of our tradition. And that has so many advantages. Uh, one is that um, most, um, most uh, of the greatest preachers of our tradition uh, are saints. So to read saints, obviously, we're not just reading the speculation, the theological speculation of a bright mind, but we're reading the testimony of a faithful heart as well, which is really beautiful. And we do that all the time when we read the Office of Readings. Um, but there are so many just amazing homilies that we can read. Augustine, John Chrysostom, Ambrose, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, John Henry Newman, Ronald Knox, uh, Benedict XVI, uh, et cetera. There's so, so many. Um, so to do that uh, helps us gain some familiarity with the best. And in any art, and preaching is an art, familiarity with the best really makes us better. Um, so that's one idea. The other interesting, I think, a beautiful benefit of reading good homilies of great minds is that that gives us uh, wonderful access to their minds and their hearts. Sometimes if we want to start, say, reading St. John Henry Newman by picking up uh, the grammar of ascent, it might be a little rough start because it can be very dense and, and difficult. But when we read the homilies of, again, John Henry Newman or Augustine or Joseph Ratzinger, we see these great minds having to distill their knowledge in a pastoral, spiritual way. So in a page or two or three, we find masterpieces of rhetoric, of theology, of, of pastoral love. And I think that's one of the most fruitful ways to, to read constantly some of these homilies will really be a fantastic way of keeping the ground prepared for when the time comes to actually uh, get ready for preaching. That's very helpful advice. Thank you so much. Uh, so from there, we have a question uh, that was submitted anonymously. Uh, what should we expect to see as fruits from employing the art of preaching? Uh, affirmation from parishioners can be nice, uh, but is this all we should expect? Uh, are there times when the preaching is good, but there's no discernible change in ourselves or in those we're preaching to? 
Could you please read it again? Absolutely, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, basically, what should we expect to see as fruits from employing the art of preaching? Uh, affirmation from parishioners can be nice, but is this uh, what we should expect? Are there times when the preaching is good, but there is no discernible change in ourselves or in those we're preaching to? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And uh, I agree, affirmation is not the goal. Uh, I mean, when that comes, we should be grateful for that because we're human and there's something beautiful about that. I don't think we need to uh, guide our own discernment of how to preach based on the affirmation that we do get or do not get. I remember one Sunday when, I mean, almost every Sunday, someone will say that was a great homily, right? I remember vividly what the one Sunday in which a parishioner thanked me so cordially, so warmly for my wonderful homily. And I have to say, well, thank you, but I actually didn't preach today. You know, the deacon preached. That really was a wake-up call. Well, maybe, you know, affirmation is, I mean, it's not insincere, but at times people don't pay enough attention. And so I totally agree with that. I totally agree as well that we won't always feel, experience directly the, the fruit of our preaching, whether in, in what we see in our people or even in ourselves. But that's love, right? Sometimes we love, as St. Therese of you said, without experiencing, without feeling the sweetness of love. Sometimes love becomes fidelity. And there are times in which we experience that sweetness. There are times in which we don't. But love is fidelity, is keeping our yes, good times and in bad. And this has a direct application, I believe, to, to preaching because our yes, demand. We, that was especially for priests and bishops. That's actually the first question we're asked in our ordination. Do you promise to proclaim the gospel faithfully, etc.? cetera? Um, so that love that becomes fidelity will bear fruit. Of this, I think we cannot have any doubt. If we faithfully try to love in our preaching, in our preparation, there will be fruits, not necessarily those that we were expecting, not necessarily when we're expecting them, but faithful preaching, prayerful preaching, always bear fruits at the right time. I don't know if that answers a question, but uh, uh, I think that's what we can expect from uh, cultivating the art of preaching. No, I think that does. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, we have another question here. Um, Again, anonymously, I have heard some priests say that they preach the words that they themselves need to hear. Uh, do you think this is a valid approach to preaching? I, I would say yes, but it depends on what that exactly means. Uh, something I will add, so I, I guess two things. One is that we do need to be penetrated by the word. I think that's an, an essential aspect of our preparation. If that word does not move us, does not challenge us, then our preaching will be empty. At the same time, um, I don't know exactly what, you know, whoever said that meant, so I'm not talking about that, but at the same time, I think it's very important to, to know that as preachers, we're entrusted with a responsibility of preaching to some people. And a key element is that we need to discern every week, just as a father has to discern what he needs to say to his children, when and how. So we need to discern what we need to say to our people, our children. And for this, uh, I think we need to let the word penetrate our hearts throughout a, a week long process of, of prayer and study and reflection and meditation and conversations. Um, but towards the end, we, we might have a lot of great ideas. You know, this will be so great. And maybe at times we get excited about this idea or this quote, et cetera. But the best way to filter all of that, to distill and know what we need to say is to spend time in prayer and ask the Lord, Lord, what do I have to say this week to your people? What, what, do, I need, what do they need to hear? Pope Francis said, uh, we need to contemplate that wo the word, but we also need to contempl contemplate our people. And I think that pastoral love that forces a question, okay, what do they need to hear? What's going on in their lives? That 
will help us to have the right balance between what we are experiencing and then what we need to give them in a responsible and loving way. Uh, that's great, thank you. Uh, just another practical question here, a question along practical lines. Do you have any recommendations about how long a homily should be? A Sunday homily, perhaps? I do. <laughs> and I, I think this has to be understood as a recommendation. And it is very clear that circumstances vary. Um, I think that between seven and, and 10 minutes is a prudent recommendation. Uh, an uh, eight ish minute homily is enough as to develop well an, a main idea with its subsequent ideas or explanations, introduction, stories, examples, um, et cetera. It is not that long that in general, many people might get lost, especially if we prepare well, if we are intentional, and I do insist a lot that our preparation has to include the details. It is many times in the details that we might lose our people, obviously, the most important thing is to be wise, but then if we're eloquent, we will be of better service. So if we have the wisdom of what we need to say, then we need to think about the hows. So how do we start? How do we transition from one idea to the other? If we have something we want to quote, when? How do we close? Do we give a practical recommendation or not? It, it's, do we talk about one reading, all the readings, a liturgical text? the entrance antiphon, et cetera. So all that discernment, there's so many, so many sources. Um, but eight minutes uh, or so, seven, eight, nine, 10, uh, I think again, it's enough as to develop well a homily and, and short enough as to keep uh, people's attention. But again, I think this is a recommendation. There might be times in which something a little longer will be amazing. And again, if it's good, people will, will love it. Um, but as a general rule, I think that is something that I feel confident uh, will be prudent and also recommendation in some documents of the church. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, another question here from a participant who's in formation for the permanent diaconate. Uh, and he asks, what do you advise uh, when the daily readings, which are the basis for the homily aren't helping uh, him to develop the homily. Uh, he's not, when he's not sure what the message is or how best to communicate it. Uh, any advice you might be able to offer there? Yes, just a clarification. Daily readings, uh, we're talking about uh, just the readings of the day, right? Not, not necessarily like daily mass, I imagine. I, I would assume. So. That day. so let me yeah. respond, uh, assuming that's the case. Well, what I would say is that uh, that demands the effort of opening our hearts to, was, to what God is saying. The, the beauty of the liturgy is that it is given to us. You know, the difference between personal prayer and liturgical prayer is that personal prayer is mainly about what we are experiencing, what we say in whichever way we wanna say it. Liturgy is mainly about what God has to say, what God has to do. And that's why as Pope Benedict said, Normally in human life, thought precedes words. We first think about something, we first experience something, and then we say something. But in the liturgy, the opposite takes place, and that is that the word precedes our thoughts. When we celebrate a liturgy, those words are given and are given to us and to everyone, which means that there is a mystery there that we need to be able to unpack. At times, I absolutely agree with the experience, we might wonder, what am I supposed to say? I, I have nothing. I, I can't see anything that I can say based on these readings for my people here and now. At times, we might start there. But what I would argue is that with prayer and persistence and preparation and convinced, normally speaking, demands days and that slow openness will precisely unlock some mysteries that maybe are not evident at the beginning. Finally, I will also say that the church tells us that a homily is an oral means of communication. 
that is a commentary on some aspect of the readings. And again, we have a number of readings, first reading Psalm, second reading on Sunday, um, verse before the gospel, really, which comes from scripture, the, the Alleluia and the, and the gospel. Uh, but also we can preach about liturgical texts, about the ordinary of the mass. I mean, how many times do we preach about the Gloria, you know, or, or the creed? And yet we can. And the propers, the entrance antiphons, the colleagues, which are so rich. And at times I think we need to be open to those beautiful texts and also even the, the rites themselves. Why do we do A, B, or C? And uh, perhaps I would say in a moment of, of just we're at a loss, we might uh, open ourselves to some other sources that can be very fruitful. And I guess finally, my second final, this is something you should not do at a homily. Say finally and keep going and, and say my final point and it's not your final point. This is one of the worst things you can do, but I'm not preaching, so I guess we can do it. Uh, but my final point here will be to go to the best. Uh, the church has so many great resources these days, the homiletic directory to mention just one, the homilies of the popes, homilies of, of saints. And they might find some elements that we in our limitation maybe cannot see. And because we are one body, we can use the insights of the best among us and that might illuminate what we actually uh, can see. Uh, so we have time for two more questions, I believe. Uh, and the next one is from uh, a senior priest here in the Archdiocese of Boston, Father John McGinnis, uh, who asks, besides biblical commentaries and homilies of great preachers, uh, what have you found helpful uh, for us to understand what is influencing the minds and hearts of our people? Uh, we talk a lot about the impact of the secularized world in which we live. What have you found uh, helpful uh, to help preachers read the signs of the times, uh, to those, uh, to have those in mind. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's, it's a somewhat difficult one to answer because obviously the signs of the times are recent, you know, are, are, are being developed right now before our eyes. And therefore we cannot necessarily find the best analysis in, in some older material. Obviously, there are insightful books about the situation. Obviously, we need to be attentive to the recent magisterium of the church uh, in many cases. Um, I think for this in particular, another way to, to another source, so to speak, would be uh, that twofold contemplation of our people that um, happens through our own uh, diligent effort to think about what's going on based on our own encounters with our parishioners, based on our own conversations. And about this, I would uh, recommend also uh, contact with uh, some trusted advisors you know, to have one or two parishioners who are trustworthy and close to us, whom we can come with questions. I mean, what's going on right now? Is there something that is particularly complicated to our people? I need to address this, and particularly when we're talking about something that is sensitive and that will, no matter what, create some controversy and some people will love and some people will hate. Uh, I think it's a, a very good thing to do to you know, call one or two people and say, this is how, my, uh, how I'm thinking. Um, I, I can approach this topic. What do you think? You know, give me some, some feedback. So perhaps not necessarily books, although there are some very insightful books about the situation. And like, I'm happy to give a few uh, suggestions about, again, secularization or what's going on in the church, affiliation, disaffiliation, um, things like that. Um, but I think um, in our daily life, the contact with our parishioners and with a few trusted advisors can be particularly fruitful. Great. Um, and with that, uh... Uh, the final question uh, was submitted anonymously. Uh, looking back through your own life's journey, uh, is there a particular homily that's greatly impacted your priesthood or your journey uh, to the priesthood, your vocation? Yes, I mean, I, for sure. And, and I think that's one of the beautiful things. You know, I, I, I do remember some homilies in which I just felt, you know, this is, I want to do this. And, and I have to say personally that preaching was one of the things that really attracted me 
um, to the priesthood. Um, I have to say as well that sometimes I felt when I was very young, ah, oh, you know, you could have said this in, in a different way. Uh, but I do remember a few. Uh, one is coming to mind right now. I, I was probably 18 and I heard a priest preaching about the letter to the Hebrews. You know, we haven't uh, yet shed blood in our fight against sin. And, you know, and, and I remember the eloquence and the conviction that moved me to say, yes, I haven't. I, I don't fight against sin uh, as I could, as I should. And definitely a, a few others um, that were very impactful. And I, I will say that's, that's the beauty. Uh, um, I don't know that I've necessarily said to some of these preachers directly, um, I mean, to some I have, but not to everyone, but how beautiful it is to know that because we don't preach ourselves and because the Lord gives us graces as ordained ministers to preach, that the seed will seeds will fall and we we don't know and we cannot entirely know control the fruits of our preaching but again if we preach with love with faith with openness if we take our preparation seriously we can know that the lord will do beautiful things and that maybe some of those homilies will be impactful for other people as well Great. Uh, well, I just want to thank you again, Father Cardo, uh, for your uh, very insightful talk, uh, the, the opportunity to uh, answer some questions. Uh, as we conclude the webinar this evening, I just want to thank everyone who was able to attend, those who were able to participate. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but I hope you found it uh, as fruitful uh, as I think we have here. Uh, if you enjoyed this webinar, please consider registering for our next one. Uh, on January 18th, hosted by Father John Gavin on the topic of the Our Father. Uh, visit our website, www.sjs.edu slash events to learn more. Uh, and we hope to see you at our upcoming Festival of Lessons and Carols uh, on December 4th or 5th. We should have information about that soon. Uh, and with that, again, big thank you to Father Cardo, and I'd like to invite Father Tom uh, to close us in a, in a prayer. Again, thank you, Father Cardo. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.